So, so my talk is going to be very different from the last three talks. The only common thing that will be there is the large end limit or large spinter limit as, as David says. So, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about, you know, last 10 years we have been working on random matrix theory. And, uh, and because I want to repeat, you know, some of you may have heard part of this talk before, but I wanted to say it again because it has some close friends with Spenter's work. So, uh, so, <laughs> so happy 65th birthday Spenter. And uh, so, you know, I'm not a string theorist. Uh, I'm a statistical physicist. And, but uh, Spenter's influence uh, goes uh, much beyond string theorists. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, you know, for many of us uh, who are graduate students in the late 80s or early 90s in TIFR, I mean, he was really an inspirational figure. And, uh, you know, as Siraj pointed out, you know, he was shielding all the nonsense out of, uh, you know, anything and giving all the younger people really, um, you know, a lot of energy and enthusiasm to work. And uh, in fact, I mean, he's, uh, he's, uh, his passion for physics and his energy and enthusiasm was really infectious. And, uh, you know, many of us sort of uh, really are very grateful for, for, uh, for giving us this. And uh, also, you know, uh, thank you very much for your contribution, not just in physics, but for the science in India, as well as for the inspiration for the younger people. So great. Congratulations. So, okay, so uh, let me uh, just start with a very, very simple problem. You know, it's just a completely trivial problem. Imagine that you have a n by n matrix uh, and uh, with just diagonal elements, okay? And, uh, and each of these diagonal elements are independent random variables drawn from a Gaussian distribution. So. And if I ask this question that, so if I, you know, the, there are n real eigenvalues, which are of course trivially are the same as diagonal elements because the matrix is diagonal. And they're also independent. So if I ask, what is the probability that all the eigenvalues are negative? That means, you know, the matrix is negative. Then it's trivially because they are independent it's just 2 to the power minus n for any n. In particular, for large n, it decays exponentially as exponential minus n. Okay, so this is a trivial, trivial answer. So this is this question that what's the probability that the matrix is negative? Okay. Now, of course, the problem becomes uh, much more complicated if you, instead of a diagonal matrix, if you now just take a n by n real symmetric matrix, and again, the independent entries are drawn independently from a Gaussian distribution. So this is the Gaussian orthogonal matrix, if you like. So if I diagonalize, I'll get n real eigenvalues again. But now the eigenvalues are strongly correlated. And if I ask the same question, that what is the probability that all the eigenvalues are negative, that is the matrix is negative, which is the same question as what is the probability that the largest eigenvalue, because if all the eigenvalues are negative, necessarily the largest eigenvalue is negative. So what's the probability for that? How does it depend on n for large n? Now this question actually, you know, comes up in many, many different contexts. So I'll probably mention one of them as I go along. And uh, from, you know, it started with ecosystems from a paper by Robert May in 1972. And it goes to string theory and it goes to, you know, mathematics uh, and uh, random polynomials and so on. And uh, so, so this, is, this, is the, this is the problem. This is how we started working on this uh, problem. And uh, in fact, I mean, you can ask, okay, so can I calculate it uh, so for some n? So n equal to one is trivial, it's just one element. So what's the probability is negative? It's a symmetric distribution, so it's half trivial. If you have n equal to 2, you can work with a little bit of difficulty, but you can calculate it exactly, and it's 2 minus root 2 over 4. Okay. So it decreases. Uh, n equal to 3 took some years, you know, even until 2007, and uh, the number is 5 minus 2 root 2 over 4 pi. And the question was what happens uh, for uh, larger n? n equal to 4 already is extremely hard. Okay. And so the question is how does Pn decay for large n as n goes to infinity? Two years back in 2006, Azami and Esther, so they actually, you know, estimated this numerically, and they found that this Pn decays exponentially, uh, not exponentially, as exponential minus n squared with a number here theta, which they estimated to be 0.27. So it's a very, very small probability. For the diagonal elements, diagonal matrix, it was exponential in n, but now it's much smaller, and uh, this is because the eigenvalues are very strongly correlated. So we want to understand this, uh, you know, this n squared decay, as well as to know whether you can compute this theta, the exponent exactly. And this is what we did with David Dean back in 2016, 2006, uh, 10 years back, so where we could compute this number exactly. And uh, this is exactly, you know, this uh, one quarter times log three. But first I want to, you know, just before I come to this result, I just want to tell you a little bit about the implication of this, just one simple example, physics example. And then I want to put this result in a much 
larger context of so-called large derivation theory of uh, the largest eigenvalue. And uh, then we'll see that this has a much deeper connection to what is called the third order phase transition that was started by uh, Gross, Witten, and Warrior back in the 80s. Okay, so let's see. So what, uh, what does it mean? Why does this problem appear? It appears in many different contexts. I mean, you know, this is this sort of picture of complex landscape. So it appears in structural glasses, uh, supercooled liquids. So essentially, you have some energy and you have some configuration. In general, it's a very multi-dimensional big space. But this is a cartoon picture in one-dimensional space. And so this has, you know, many local minimum. Uh, and there's a one global minimum, maybe. So for example, glasses, you can actually get stuck in one of these metastable minimum. And then, you know, uh, thermal fluctuations can take you out of it and you can go to another minimum and so on, taking a very, very long time, which is the sort of uh, responsible for the slow dynamics in glasses. But it also appears in string theory because, you know, each of these minimum, uh, they can represent some uh, phase of string theory. I'm not really expert in string theory. But, uh, and there, the, you know, each phase represents uh, sort of one universe in some sense within this anthropic uh, principle of land uh, string theory. And the value of this energy here, potential energy uh, at the minimum, is the cosmological constant. And, um, and here also the metastability might have sort of interesting consequence uh, that, you know, our universe might be invaded by another local minimum and uh, creating a doomsday scenario, which uh, Ashok Sen has uh, written a very nice article and a very illuminating article on this. So, so the question, so therefore, the, uh, to understand the, this number of local minimum and local maximum or the number of saddle points in a complex landscape is a very interesting problem. Uh, so more generally, very simplistically, I mean, if you th imagine a particle moving in a multidimensional potential and uh, just by steepest descent dynamics, you have a stationary point, so particle will get stuck if uh, at the stationary points where the grad V is zero. And uh, if you expand your potential around the stationary point, so this is just up to the quadratic term. So this, there's a Hessian matrix here. And the, this Hessian matrix is a real matrix. And the eigenvalues of the Hessian matrix will decide whether your, uh, you know, the stationary point is a local minimum or local maximum or a saddle point. Okay. So for instance, I mean, if you have just n equal to one dimensional surface, it's just a number here, second derivative. If it is negative, you have a local maximum. If it is positive, you have a local minimum. Here there is no saddle point. If you have n equal to two, it's a two by two matrix, uh, two eigenvalues. Uh, if both are negative, you have a local maximum. If both are positive, you have a local minimum. And if one of them is positive and one is negative, you have a saddle point. Okay. So what people did in, in glasses and as, as well as in, uh, in, the, uh, in the string theory community is that people looked at what's called the random Hessian model, which simply means that you, know, you just take this real symmetric Hessian matrix and you ignore all the correlations between different things and just assume that this is a GOE matrix, just a Gaussian matrix. And then, uh, this Pn, that question I raised, that is, what's the probability that all the eigenvalues are negative? So what's the probability that all the eigenvalues of this Hessian matrix is negative, which is the same as the probability that the largest eigenvalue of the Hessian matrix is negative? So this is just a fraction of local minimum or local maximum by symmetry. And uh, so the fact that it, it actually is very, very small, you know, e to the power minus theta n square, which says that the most of the, you know, stationary points within this uh, Hessian model, random Hessian model are saddle points. And only, you know, very few are uh, local minimum or local maximum, which actually might be a good news for, uh, because it says that our universe is, you know, pretty much localized uh, minimum and there is no uh, sort of, you know, the, um, uh, no, no fear of other universe invading us. And, uh, <laughs> but, okay, this is, but this is sort of, you know, the very simplistic uh, idea. And uh, so the question is that, you know, the, is it just this number or what does it mean in a more general context? And that's what I want to tell you in the next few minutes, that is actually part of a more large, uh, deeper large deviation theory in uh, probability theory. And uh, so to understand that, so let me just remind you a little bit, uh, you know, just a brief reminder of the Gaussian random matrices. Most of you are familiar with it. But uh, we are talking about, you know, again, n by n random matrix, and I'm talking, I'm interested in real eigenvalues, so which means that the matrix can be real symmetric or complex Hermitian or complex quaternionic. And I choose the entries uh, independently from a Gaussian distribution. And I choose the variance such that you can write it as a trace of j dagger j, so that it's invariant under the rotation. And it could be orthogonal rotation for real symmetry, or it could be unitary rotation for complex summation. And uh, so, so this is the Gaussian ensemble of uh, random matrices. Once you diagonalize, you have n real eigenvalues. And these eigenvalues are strongly correlated. And the you know, spectral statistics of these eigenvalues is the sort of you know, name of game in random matrix theory. That is, you want to understand you know, different questions associated 
with this joint distribution of this uh, eigenvalue. So the joint distribution was actually originally computed long back by Wigner, and in fact, this is uh, up to a normalization constant here. You have this Gaussian part, which just uh, you know gets transported from the uh, trace, and uh, but then there's an additional part which comes from the Jacobian of the transformation, and this is the van der Mond term. And in fact, this there's a beta here, which depends on the which ensemble you are talking about, and uh, so it's quantized to one, two, or four, and uh, it's because of this van der Mond term, the eigenvalues get strongly correlated. There's a repulsion between eigenvalues here. Two eigenvalues do not like to be sitting next to each other. And uh, so Dyson had a very nice interpretation of this, uh, of this uh, joint distribution. You can, write, you can raise this uh, you know, x to the power beta as e to the power beta log x and write as a Boltzmann weight. So, so you, have a, you, know, the, you can forget about the original matrix now and just think in terms of the eigenvalues. So the eigenvalues are actually just like point charges on a real line, they're real. And uh, they are sitting in an external harmonic potential, which is the lambda I squared confining potential. But they are repelling each other pairwise by the log interaction. So they are actually two-dimensional Coulomb charges, but sitting confined on a one-D line. And, and then this is just just the you know the statistical mechanics of a long-range one-dimensional system with the energy given by this uh, configuration of charges. And so what this uh, potential does, confining potential is trying to push all the charges towards the bottom of this potential. Whereas the repulsion is trying to spread them about. As a result, when you take the um, uh, large end limit and you calculate the average density of uh, eigenvalues, which is just a fraction of eigenvalues between lambda and lambda plus d lambda, normalized to one. Okay? So, so this object in the large end limit converges to the so called Wigner semicircular law, which means that all the eigenvalues are supported between minus root two and plus root two, with lots of eigenvalues near the center in the bulk, and uh, lesser and lesser eigenvalues as you go towards the edge. This is the weakness semicircular law. And uh, so one can easily estimate these you know, interparticle distance. Uh, so for example, if I'm in the bulk near the center of the trap, so there you know, the typical distance between the particles is about one over n. And you can estimate this just by you know, just taking your weakness density and integrating from zero to L bulk and setting it to be one over n. Yeah, because if you go up to distance L bulk, you get one over n, only one particle. So if you just substitute this guy here and just work out L bulk, it will be one over n in the large n limit. But on the other hand, if you are near the edge, so you do the same exercise. Uh, so just to substitute the Wigner semicircle and integrate from minus root, root two minus L edge up to root two and set it to be one over N. I just plug it in here and you can easily estimate. Just a, you find that the typical distance between particles near the edge is of order n to the power minus two third. So that means the, you know, the distance between the particles is much larger near the edge than in the center, which is normal because the density is going down here. They're becoming sparser and sparser. So the main thing that we learned from this little exercise here is that uh, the L edge is much bigger than L bulk, and that this typical scale of fluctuation near the edge is n to the power minus two thousand. Okay. okay. So with this, just a basic uh, uh, reminder. So now let's go to the largest eigenvalue because that's a sort of uh, most of the recent excitements in statistical physics and probability theory is about uh, the largest eigenvalue, largest lambda max or lambda mean, if you like, symmetrical sense. So if I look at the largest eigenvalue from each sample. So it's a random variable. It's going to fluctuate from sample to sample. It's, going, its average value is going to be root two, which is the age of the weakness semicircular law. And we have just seen that its fluctuation should be on a typical fluctuation should be on a scale of order n to the power minus two third. Okay. So this is this much is fine. But we want to know what is the real distribution of this uh, of this lambda max on this scale. So average is root two, and typical fluctuation is uh, n to the power minus two third. So if you ask what is the full distribution? of lambda max, the probability distribution. So this has a scaling form. Uh, so you know, this is the deviation from root two on a scale of n to the power two third. And there's a scaling function. This is just a normalization. And this scaling function is uh, what was computed by Tracy and Widom, these two mathematicians from uh, California Davis. And uh, so in 1994, and uh, so this satisfies some you know, little bit complicated final bit two equation. I'm not going into the details. But, uh, but what happened is that these distributions, how do they look like? They look like Gaussian, but they're not Gaussian because they depend on this beta index, Dyson index, and they have non-Gaussian tails. So you have x to the power, e to the power minus mod x cube here, and exponential minus x to the power three by two on the positive side. So they're highly non-symmetrical. And, uh, and after this tracy widom distribution is found in, in 1994, since then actually, you know, this distribution has been found in many, many different areas from directed polymer to KPZ equation growth models, sequence alignment, and we, I'll talk about large and gauge theory later, liquid crystal screen glasses, and many other models. And if you are interested, there have been, there have been some, uh, quite a few 
uh, recent uh, popular science articles on this, uh, you know, ubiquity of terrestrial medium distribution. And um, so, uh, so this is sort of known for the typical fluctuations. Uh, so one question is that, uh, so here is the picture. So you have the weakness semicircular law, lambda max, it fluctuates, and it has a distribution. And what we have just learned, that the, the probability distribution of the lambda max on a scale of n to the power minus two third is described by the Tracy Widom, Tracy Widom distribution function. But the question is that what happens when I'm looking for fluctuations which are not of the typical scale n to the power minus two third, but on a larger scale, let's say the scale of order one. So this is the large deviation question. How to describe the probability of atypical large fluctuations going beyond the typical fluctuations? So when this, de when this deviation is of order one and not of order n to the power minus two third, which is a very small uh, number. In fact, this question is what we need because the original question I set out is that what's the probability that lambda max is less than zero, right? But zero is here, so that means I'm looking for deviation of order root two, which is a large deviation. So in order to answer that question, Tracy Widom is not enough. I have to actually look at the large deviation tails. And uh, so this is the, so this is the sort of original motivation for us to look at the large deviation tails. And uh, so let me just, you know, uh, summarize the main results and without uh, giving you the uh, derivation. So, in fact, what happens is if you look at the distribution of P of lambda max, it has three different behavior. So, in the typical regime, when W minus root 2 is of order n to the power minus 2 third, then it's given by the Tracy Widom function, which is the blue part of this curve, central peak part. But then there's this red left large deviation when root 2 minus W is of order 1 to the left of the center, uh, left of root 2. So, there it actually goes like exponential minus beta n square times some rate function phi minus of w. And it's easy to understand why is it n square, I'll come back in a minute. Whereas, on the other hand, when w minus root 2 is of order 1, that is, you are looking at the, this green tail on the right side, there it's asymmetrical. It actually goes like it's minus beta n times some other function phi plus of w. So these two rate functions were uh, computed explicitly and uh, using Coulomb gas and saddle point method, but uh, I'm not going to give you the details. But one thing to notice is that this is the full function, rate function. And in fact, as you approach the W goes to root two from the left, this guy goes, you know, it goes to zero as a power of three. And this is important, as we'll see later. Similarly, large division function on the right side, uh, it approaches to a power of three by two, as I, as I approach to root two from the right. So this is the main picture, that there is two large division tails, and there's a central Tracy Widom peak. Okay. And after these calculations of these uh, rate functions, it actually turned out that these rate functions were, you know, very useful in many, many different problems, which were, you know, where, where it is this kind of uh, exactly similar question appears. And uh, since I don't have too much time, I'll not go into those. But, uh, but let me now talk about this uh, third. So why is it a sort of, th what, what is this got to do with the third order phase transition? So the point is that this guy here, so the, this is the cumulative distribution, probability that lambda max is less than some given value w. It goes like e to the power minus beta n square times phi minus of w for w less than root two. So what is the physical meaning of this? It's like you know, you're asking what's the probability that if my largest eigenvalue is less than w, what that means is that if the largest eigenvalue is less than w, so necessarily, so you have this w here, so necessarily all the eigenvalues are to the left of w. So you had this Wigner semicircular law, so you're pushing these charges from the left to the left of w. So this costs a collective energy cost because you know there, there are long range interaction. So it cost of energy is of order n square, and that's that's the reason why is it of n square here. And uh, and if you and in fact it has the interpretation of this object of logarithm of the probability uh, cumulative distribution of lambda max. And if you divide by n square, so this goes to phi minus of w on the left hand side, and it vanishes. So this guy you know vanishes as as a power of three, and it remains zero. On the right side, on the other hand, you have the, the cumulative distribution is, uh, is of the form one minus exponential minus beta n phi, phi minus of w. So, so what you do, when you take the log of this, you know, the, the corrections are all exponential in e to the power minus beta n. So these are very, very small corrections. So basically it's zero essentially in the large n limit. Whereas in the, on the left side, you know, it has a well-defined one over n expansion. And uh, this is, in fact, it goes to zero. As a, so third derivative is, the, uh, is discontinuous. In that sense, it's a third order phase transition. So, so the, to, to be more precise, so the, you know, just to, what I'm saying is that if I, if I look at the PDF of the lambda max, so there are these three parts for finite but large n. 
So there is a central tracheoidum, there is a left part which is exponential minus n square of phi minus, and right part exponential minus n. Now as we increase n, if you, if you take n goes to infinity limit, what happens is that this central part, it sort of squeezes to a point, essentially, and what you see is only the large division tails. Even though the probabilistically they are very small, I mean, they only, you know, this is almost like a point mass here, and you only see the red and life, uh, red and green part, the tails, and these tails are the analog of the two phases and with the, with the corresponding free energies here and phi minus and phi plus. And so this point becomes a critical point in the sense that if you look at the PDF and if you, uh, it's, it's a continuous function, but its third derivative becomes discontinuous at the, at the center root two. Okay, so that's the sort of uh, third order phase transition. And, uh, and in fact, the tracy widom distribution is just a, you know, the finite size crossover function connecting the free energies of the two phases. Okay, so this is the, sort of picture, and, uh, and in fact, I mean, as I said, this, uh, the, the physically speaking, so this is the picture, so in the large end limit, so you have this, uh, this is the left phase, uh, where the charges are pushed to the left of root two, and here, on the other hand, is, you know, if you want to make a deviation of uh, lambda max much bigger than root two, all, it, all you can do is the configuration that dominates these integrals, is that you just take out one charge from your weakness C, and just, uh, you know, pull it out, basically. Okay, so that, that's a dominant contribution. So this is like this, you know, weak coupling phase of uh, large and gauge theory, and this is like a strong coupling phase. So then, and that's why here, the behavior is order n, exponential cost of energy is order n, because that's the interaction of this charge with the rest of the things. Whereas if I, here, if I want to push it, it leads to reorganization of all the charges. So the cost of energy is order n squared, because everybody is interacting with everybody. So the, you know, rough qualitative picture is, you know, it's, uh, if you are, uh, you know, driving on a highway, and uh, let's say this is the slowest car, and you have a traffic jump behind it, so if this guy wants to back up, you know, back, then everybody has to back up. So it's a collective phase involving, involving collective degrees of freedom. If you want to make any deviation in the back, everybody has to move back. Whereas if it wants to move forward, it can just, just you know, drive away. You know, it doesn't affect the rest of the guys. Okay. So that's why it's much easier here uh, to move. That's why it's e to the power minus n, whereas here it's e to the power minus n squared. And uh, so this is the sort of picture, the phase transition, that W, which is my, you know, the argument of the probability of lambda max, and I can, you know, think of that as a tuning parameter. When W is much bigger than root two, then, uh, then you have a gap between the Wigner semicircular law and this. Rest of the charges are sitting on a semicircle, no problem, and the cost of energy is just this guy interaction with this rest. I'm finished here. And then you approach the root two, and you have the critical point here, and here you push, and then you, it leads to a reorganization of the density, it changes from Wigner semicircular law, and it cost of energy n squared. So this picture of uh, the, the, the in, in spirit, this third order phase transition is very similar to the uh, to the one that was uh, found by Gross, Witten, and Moria in the uh, in the eighties. And uh, in fact, uh, you can also find a nice review by Marcos, who is here. He in fact has a book now right now on this uh, on these uh, problems. And in fact, uh, in this uh, Gross, Witten, Moria model was just a you know uh, uh, two dimensional. Uh, lattice gauge model where you have, you know, on a link, so you have the Wilson action, so you have U, which is a n by n unitary matrix, and the, the action is just one over G squared times trace of the, you know, over a placket, the product of GU plus summation conjugates. And what they figured out, this is the exactly solvable model, what they figured out is that if you plot one over G here and one over n here, so n goes to infinite limit, you are on this line, there's a strict phase transition between a strong coupling phase to weak coupling phase, and if you go at a finite n, then you have a crossover from, uh, from a strong coupling to a coupling phase, and this is this so-called double scaling regime. And, um, and uh, here, you know, it's, it's exactly the same physics here. So this is again gross weight and warrior model, one over n, and you have a G coupling strength here. So here you have the weak coupling phase at low G, and for G bigger than G, so you have a strong coupling phase and a crossover regime. And in the lambda max distribution has exactly the same feature. So here my tuning parameter is lambda max itself. I'm looking at a probability distribution, and you have a, you know, root two is your critical point. So if you're below root two, you have a pushed phase, which is the analog of strong coupling phase, strongly interacting. And uh, whereas here, the pulled phase is the equivalent of weak coupling phase. And in fact, these are like the instantons in, uh, in, the, in the large end gauge theory. And uh, so this is, this is the sort of uh, the, the analogy between the, uh, between the two problems. And so point is that the tracy widom is a universal crossover function connecting the pushed and pulled. And in fact, Tracy Widom also existed in there, but at that point, people didn't look at that. You know, same pond equation appeared there as well, but there was no uh, probabilistic interpretation at that time. So, and since then, you know, this, uh, this third order phase transition 
we have found in many, many different problems and uh, from conductance and entanglement entropy of random pure state and more recently the height distribution in one plus one dimensional KTG growth models and with various collaborators uh, we have worked for the last uh, 10 years or so. And uh, so, the, so the main uh, message is that uh, wherever tracy Williams distribution occurs, there is an underlying third order phase transition. This is our main conjecture. And so the tracy Williams is a sort of finite size crossover function at this uh, third Is, is this transition only qualitatively similar, or it's exactly the? No, no, it's not exactly similar. It's qualitatively similar because in the in the gloss witten warrior model, see, effectively you can mod into the unitary model. So you have the charges sitting on a circle, basically. Okay. So there, the picture is that you know, we have this circle, and you have these eigenvalues which are on this circle. Okay, and uh, so as long as you know, if G is less than G C, then you have an arc here. Okay, and as we increase the coupling strength. This arc actually increases and finally covers the whole space. So the mechanism is always that, that is whenever the charge density, actually, you know, the gap goes to zero, basically. It, it fills a wall, okay. The same mechanism here also. Is when it fills a wall, and if it is a square root singularity, we'll always get a third order.